recording. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen. Just give a quick intro. So hopefully everybody can see Scrum Masters of the Universe with three interesting looking characters there. So welcome to Scrum Masters of the Universe. Glad to have you all. Our mission is is really to provide a place for agile enthusiasts to learn, to grow and flourish and applying agile in the world of work, possibly even outside of work. Uh, we believe there's great value in getting outside of our individual silos and connecting with other people that are passionate about growth as being agile practitioners. So that's a little bit about our mission. Our leadership team, our fearless leader, Jamie Kriegel is listed there. She's the founder of this group and she's the, the main head honcho. And tagging along are myself, Mark Metz, and Katrin Hemmeltz. Katrin's on the line as well. So you see her there. And I think Katrin's going to share, if she hasn't already, share our LinkedIn profiles so you can connect with us. That's great. Some ways to connect with us. We're all over the place. We've got the socials covered, right? LinkedIn. Facebook, Meetup, YouTube, maybe we'll get a TikTok one day, I'm not sure, but there's how you can connect with us. Katrin will check, we'll add those to the chat as well. All right, a couple upcoming events that we have in October. So on the 12th, we've got Daniel Mezik and he's gonna have an open space event for us talking about succeeding with Agile by improving employee engagement. I don't know about you, but that sounds very interesting to me. And also on the 28th, we have Rosemarine Galen. I'm probably butchering her name. I tried to pronounce it best I could, but um, my Dutch is not very great. Rose is going to talk to us about nonverbal communication in Scrum. I've heard her talk before, and it's a different topic than you've heard before. And I, I found it very interesting. I hope you do too. Learn something that you didn't know about how we're communicating, especially in this virtual world that we have here today. So invite you to join those events, see those links. Our sponsors, so thank you for our sponsors, Agile Alliance, Agile.ai and Scrum.org. Appreciate them very much. Please patronize them because they help us to be able to put this on. We appreciate them very, very much. Okay. So what you're really here to see, not hear me blabbering on about who knows what, but we've got some great guest hosts here today, Ravi Verma. So Ravi is the founder of his company Smooth Apps, and I will say this, this session is on 10 steps in, to integrate evidence-based management with Scrum. And hopefully everyone here has heard about evidence-based management. It's pretty hot topic right now. Um, something interesting about Ravi is 10 years ago, he attended the very first EBM workshop taught by none other than Ken Schwaber. So Ravi knows what he's talking about. And also Nagesh. Uh, Nagesh is somebody who's very passionate about causing change and improving business. Uh, give me just a second here. Sorry, y'all. Uh, improving business results. Uh, his mission resonates with Scrum.org's mission of helping people. And he's been engaged with many large enterprise transformations to a lean, agile approach, organizational dynamics, and creating high-performance teams. So both speakers that we have today are very highly qualified, and I think you're going to find them engaging. I've known Ravi for a couple of years now, and never come away disappointed from his talks. So he's a great, great speaker. All right, well, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ravi and Nagesh. I will stop sharing and let you guys take over. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark uh, and Katrin and Jamie and everyone. Thank you for giving us an opportunity. Let me start sharing my screen. All right. I have three monitors and I don't know if I'm sharing the right screen or not. So what do you, do you see a title slide? Yes. 
All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Uh, before we get started, I want to tell you a story. Okay. Uh, so I did my master's in entrepreneurship from a college down the road here in Dallas called Southern Methodist University. And one of the most memorable lectures I got was from a practitioner who was a serial entrepreneur. I think the company was called Wayport. So back in the day when Wi-Fi was just, you know, coming out, uh, this company was in the business of providing Wi-Fi access to hotels and restaurant chains and so on. So the founder comes in uh, and, and, you know, the founder was the speaker, guest, guest speaker in our class. And so he says, he told, the, told us a story. They were bidding for a big contract, the contract to provide Wi-Fi access to all the McDonald's in the world. Okay. So there's this humongous auditorium, hundreds of people and all McDonald's influencers, decision makers, and speaker after speaker is coming from different companies and they're talking about 802.11 and gigahertz and megahertz and bits and bytes. And finally, our speaker goes into the auditorium and everybody has got a glazed look on their eyes. I would get a glazed look in my eyes. And you know, I, I was actually in network analysis and monitoring, but like who the heck wants to find out about 802.11 protocols and all that, right? So the speaker comes in and he reads the room and he sees, oh my God, I've got like hundreds of McDonald's, uh, you know, team members with glazed looks in their eyes. Like, oh my God, somebody shoot me. When will this get over? So he reads the room and the first thing he says is, hello everyone, how are you doing? Today I am here to tell you how to sell more hamburgers. And the whole room lit up, right? Because that's what they care about. They don't give a hoot about 802.11 Wi-Fi protocols and bits and bytes. Who cares? They are in McDonald's because they want to sell more hamburgers. What the heck does this story have to do with this webinar? I feel that the mistake practitioners like me make is we are so passionate about agile and scrum and evidence-based management that we start speaking in this jargon to our clients, to our teams, to our business stakeholders. And they probably get a glazed look on their eyes because our jargon is similar to talking about 802.11 Wi-Fi protocol. Maybe very fascinating to us, but they don't care. They just wanna sell more hamburgers. So why am I telling this story? I'm requesting you to listen to this webinar from a particular stance. And that stance is curiosity and empathy for your stakeholders, whoever they might be, and to ask yourself, what can we learn from Nagesh and Ravi and our conversation today that will help our stack stakeholders sell more hamburgers? And whatever they're selling, it's an analogy, right? So that's my ask. Uh, and this is a, one of the biggest lessons I learned from Ken Schwaber, Agile and Scrum evidence-based management are not the end goal. They are a means to an end. In my mind, the end goal is to avoid the needless destruction of human potential in the name of Agile and Scrum. A lot of time and money is being wasted through the robotic ritualistic implementation of Agile and Scrum and we lose sight of our reason for existence. We are here to help people sell more hamburgers. So that's my ask, all right? All right, with that, let's dive in. Let's see how we can use Scrum and evidence-based management to sell more hamburgers. All right. Uh, you know enough about Nagesh and I, so I'm not gonna bore you. Uh, the intent of this webinar is to try and help you integrate in a very practical way. Two powerful ideas, Scrum and evidence-based management. Before we dive in, please take a moment in the chat panel to type in your most important question that you want to get answered by the end of this webinar. And what Nagesh and I will do is we'll try and integrate your questions into the flow of the webinar as best as we can. So maybe it'll give you one minute, don't overthink it, stream of consciousness. What is the most important question you want to get answered by the end of this webinar? We'll be monitoring the chat panel. How 
how to sell EBM without EBM lingo. Thank you. Can EBM be integrated with other frameworks like Kanban? Very good. How to get teams and businesses excited to do this? What metrics can I put in place? How do I get started? Mm -hmm. Great questions. How do I define KPO? I don't know if that might be a typo, KPI, but I don't know what KPO is. So if Milosh, if Milo, if you could clarify. Org still focus on one, one time, yeah. Time budget quality, how can we use EBM to address this? Okay, KPO is for outcomes, key performance outcomes, very good. All right, good. That gives us a good sense for where the audience might be. And we'll please continue to type in your questions. We'll be monitoring them along the way. And uh, what's a mindset related to lashing out EBM, maybe hashing out or lasting? Okay. All right. Very good. So we got a good sense for what would be valuable. Uh, and we'll keep monitoring the questions. So, Nagesh, if you don't mind, uh, if you could please take over and, and get us started with a quick intro to EBM. Nagesh, over Thank to you. you. Thank you so much, Ravi. And uh, I'm really looking forward to all awesome people. Um, so evidence-based management, how does... So let us take you to, to, to some of the roots, right? So in the past century, there were many studies and researches done on evidence-based medication. Uh, so I'm going to ask you that when was the last time uh, you gone to meet a doctor? I hope that was not recently, but when you go to meet the doctor, there are two kinds of doctors, right? Uh, one is the doctor where you go to the doctor and say, hey, hey, doctor, I'm, I'm having this little bit of, you know, anxiety. Oh, anxiety. That's very common. So maybe take this medicine and you'll get treated, right? You take that medicine and then after some days, back, you come back and say, hey, I'm feeling a little headache. Hey, headache is very common. You should have these medicines with your home, right? So I think you don't have to come to me. So this medicine should help you with head headache. Okay, cool. I'm having this temperature. So a little bit, it's, it's rising 102, 103. So you should always keep a paracetamol with you. So this kind of, you know, um, medication was more like a circumstantial based medication. And this, this, this used to happen with a lot of people and it, it happened with me also. For example, you have a little bit of temperature, you have a paracetamol, you take it. Again, it comes a little more, Dolo 650. Now you feel a little acidity, you take antacid. And this is what we do. Sometimes even people keep prescriptions with them so that if the same disease happens again, you can actually use the same medication, right? So. But imagine you go to a doctor and this is how the doctor is having a conversation with you. Hey, doctor, I'm feeling a little anxiety. Oh, that doesn't sound good. Tell me a little bit more about it. Ah, so how long it's been happening with you? So it's been happening with me since yesterday. What have you done so far? Have you taken any medications by yourself? Did you, did you eat anything outside food? Okay, so let me write you certain tests and show me this report. And based on the diagnosis of the report, I might really tell you what is supposed to be done. Now, this was more collecting direct evidence. And this was the, uh, you know, the concept of evidence-based medication, which was very successful in the past century. Now, this concept was very popular in medicines. So... Ken Schwaber, Scrum.org, they got really inspired and said that why can't we apply that to management? And the roots are coming from evidence-based medicine. So now we are going to talk about evidence-based management because one of my mentors, John Matone, who wrote this book, The Intelligent Leader, John says that prescription before diagnosis is malpractice in medication. I'm going to repeat. Prescription before diagnosis is a malpractice in medication, so in management. 
so in management and often i have seen organizations trying to really measure success but unfortunately what we are measuring uh, is often not the appropriate things so here is my question to you before i really give you any more details about ebm uh, what are you measuring right now in your organization when i with regards to success so how do you know that you are creating successful products how do you know you are delivering value to your customers so use the chat put some measures what are you measuring right now we'll give you a minute and we'll see customer sat how many customers are using a new feature net promoter score direct, direct. feedback on, on budget, budget. On, time. <laughs> on time on budget reduced claims give it 20 more seconds speed to market hmm innovation interesting use of product or prescription described Okay, so I get a sense, I get a sense of what kind of measures are there. So I just saw that somebody asked for the book. Here is the book name, The Intelligent Leader by John Maton. So by the way, it doesn't talk about EBM, but he does talk about prescription before diagnosis and malpractice. So EBM, evidence-based management, offers us a complementary empirical approach to help organizations continuously improve customer outcomes, organizational capabilities, and business results under the conditions of complexity and uncertainty. So it really offers us the lens. I can, I can see it's all the different dimensions in which we can define and measure value. Value in itself is very hard to really measure. First of all, define and then measure, but EBM offers us a lens, right? There's a saying in our country in Hindi that uh, I'm not going to say exactly because you'll not understand that, but the saying converts to English as, um, if you do not like the world, then don't change the world, but change your lens, right? If, if, you, if you wear blue glass lenses, then the world is blue. And if you wear yellow, then it's, it turns yellow. So the change starts with yourself. So EBM offers the different kinds of lenses. Often the kind of measures which I have seen like speed to market, uh, on budget, on time, employee satisfaction. Now, some of the measures often are activities, outputs, which are your organization's capability of delivering value. So often activities are things that people in the organizations are doing, such as performing work, uh, going to meetings, having discussions, writing code, uh, creating reports, attending an event, and all these things are often activities. And these activities contribute to our ability to innovate. And then there are things which are like outputs and outputs are often things that the organization produces, uh, such as releases, inclu which includes maybe some product backlog items, uh, features, hey, we created reports, uh, defect reports, maybe some product reviews. And these are outputs. Often the outputs are seen as measures which contributes towards time to market. So ability to innovate is what is stopping us currently from delivering the new value. Like we have so many defects. Oh my God, what do we do now? So we have lots of technical debt. We need to build quality. And then how quickly you can deliver the new value, that's the time to market. These two are organization's capability to deliver value and most organizations focus here only. 
imagine you are a pizza hut shop and you have two kinds of measures what would you measure and you can you can you know type in the chat right option 1 how many varieties of pizzas do you have option 2 which variety of pizza the user orders the most you can put you can respond into the chat which one is more valuable from a pizza hut uh, point of view i'm going to repeat option 1 is how many varieties of pizzas do you have and which variety of pizza your user orders the most option 2 option 2 mhm option 2 many people are steering towards option 2 right so full marks and that helps us really steer the wheel towards outcomes outcomes are always measured as the change in customers behavior how happy the customers are right now how happy the employees are right now which features the customers are using most of the times where are they spending most of the times now that is called current value so basically that's measured as outcomes and then impact is always measured as a long term change right so impact is like customer base market share the unrealized value so the top two which is the current value outcomes and the unrealized value which is impact are market value these are always market facing the bottom one is often the organization facing so we always say that focus more on outcome and impact without losing focus on activities and outputs i never say that ignore outputs because output and activities are only in our control ravi you want to add something here i think you can add a lot of value here yeah you know what uh, nagesh as i was uh, listening to you one idea that uh, came to my mind is uh, to illustrate the difference between current value and unrealized value so in america there's a uh, this uh, app called doordash right and doordash has been a life saver i'm sure there are equivalent apps like uber eats in other parts of the world and so the current value for doordash was how many customers like me are using doordash or uber eats to get food delivered to their house or maybe scheduling food pick up but doordash probably realized there is unrealized value maybe their customers are using instacart to get groceries delivered and so now doordash is saying wait a minute that's unrealized value i have a customer base i have the infrastructure ultimately it's just delivering an item from point a to point b and if i can use the infrastructure to deliver food why can i not deliver groceries so doordash has now started expanding to create uh, or to tap into the unrealized value and now they've started ordering groceries so they are you know going into the instacart territory and i feel that they even started order uh, offering maybe bed bath and beyond i'm surprised it still exists but it's not just groceries it's not just food they are just expanding so nagesh as you were talking that's the analogy that came to my mind of probably an example of a business that many people can relate to which is expanding from current value to unrealized value now remember as a doordash customer i don't care what is your velocity i don't care how many scrum certifications you have all i care as a doordash customer is did you get me the groceries or the food that i ordered at quality at the time and place i wanted right so this is a contrast between focusing on activities versus focusing on customer outcomes and business impact so now guys that's what came to my mind great uh, you know thank you for setting up ebm back to you thank you so much ravi so so one of the big pitfalls of understanding ebm is people always think that ebm is only about measures measures are one of the thing one of the pillars of ebm but ebm is more about two more things and and that's what makes it complementary to scrum framework so if 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 i were to say that there are three like scrum has three pillars so transparency inspection adaptation and when you combine them with trust it becomes empiricism right so ebm also has three pillars and those are empiricism uh, goals and then evidence and 
evidence you can also treat that as measures so this is only one portion which is measures but what about empiricism and goals so that's how we are going to take the next few slides where we are going to explore how ebm complements empiricism right which scrum also talks about all right okay so nagesh you want to do this should i do it <clears throat> go ahead ravi i think all right okay so nagesh and i will pass the ball back and forth uh, so let's start talking about integrating evidence based management into scrum uh, scrum is about curiosity learning and course correction right so the it starts from a place of humility no matter how smart we are nobody is smarter than the market and all of our ideas user stories defect fixes are suspect until proven otherwise by the market that's a quote from kurt bitner right so there's a single source of truth which is the market and if we are humble to say let's find the least amount of time and money that we can put at risk to deploy something to market and then see how the market reacts learn and course correct that's the essence of ebm and scrum okay so let's start uh integrating ebm into scrum one possible place to start is start with backlog refinement and in backlog refinement start creating transparency into what are your targets some complementary artifacts uh that you could use in scrum to create alignment and transparency around your target is product vision uh in scrum.org pspo workshop we tell you some techniques it could be product box it could be the elevator pitch there are plenty of techniques doesn't matter what technique but create a true north in terms of what is the problem you are trying to solve with your product product vision not a scrum artifact but it could be a complementary artifact product goal this is a measurable uh way to quantify quantify your outcome this it has with the latest version of the scrum guide this is part of uh part of the scrum guide and provides context for your product backlog in the ebm terminology this is analogous this could be analogous to a strategic goal so we are trying to build a bridge between the evidence based management guide and the scrum guide okay and then you have intermediate goals so let's imagine that you have a multi year product vision you have a multi year measurable product goal perhaps you can break it down into an annual goal which could be an intermediate goal perhaps you can slice that annual goal further into quarterly goals if in case you are a publicly traded company chances are that you make quarterly presentations to your investors so we could have a, a next level of quarter intermediate goals called quarterly goals and then perhaps you can go even further and you can keep slicing and maybe you could have monthly goals and so on right so when you are doing backlog refinement perhaps you start adding these kind of a complementary artifacts and details to your product backlog uh and start tying your product backlog to your product vision product goal the strategic goal and intermediate goals okay and maybe that's what you're doing in day 1 you have a workshop product owner solicits the feedback from multiple stakeholders crowd sources the wisdom bottom up intelligence and starts putting these together the second is transparency requires visualization so one possible way is once you have quantified your measures you could visualize them in a scoreboard a picture is worth a thousand words in our past experience when we talk people's eyes glaze over but when we give them a scoreboard they lean forward nagesh and i worked for a company where we showed a mock up of an evidence based management scoreboard to the ceo of the company multi billion dollar publicly traded company and he leaned forward and he said when can i have that took us 2 years there was so much red tape and bureaucracy that even after 2 years in a company where the ceo wants a scoreboard i failed i was not able to give them that scoreboard and that's why we are doing the work we are doing we are learning from our mistakes and trying to give you step by step approaches so that doesn't happen to you right a picture is worth a thousand words so visualize your product scoreboard and now start engaging the team send the picture around to your key stakeholders without whose collaboration you cannot improve your outcomes and ask them what do you think how can we make this better okay so the first three steps are visualize 
uh, target, visualize, and engage. Stop us anytime if you have questions. Some of you have asked, what, what might a scoreboard look like? This is just a sample example. Some of you have asked, what, might, what kind of metrics should we use? Key performance outcomes. We recently shot a five minute video, which is available on our YouTube channel, the Smooth Apps YouTube channel. It's also available as a video blog on scrum.org. How to get started with managing outcomes in five minutes or less. So if you're interested, go watch that video, read the blog. But this is just an example. So this is a company, they wanted to get started in five minutes or less, they picked a few metrics, revenue, budget, customer satisfaction, defects, time to market and employee set. In five minutes, you can come up with the targets for six metrics, send it out. Chances are it will get a visceral reaction from your stakeholders. Some of them will say, man, I love this. I wish I could have had this earlier. Some others will say, man, I hate this. And then you can say, fantastic. Tell me what you hate. How can we make it better? You know, the opposite of love and caring and engagement is not anger. The opposite is apathy. One of our biggest enemies in delivering value to companies is that people who have the, have the power to make an impact are apathetic to agile, scrum, and evidence-based management. We want to change that. We want people to be engaged, all right? So whether they like it or not, Chances are you're off to the races because you got them engaged. All right. So now, based on what you've heard so far, think about your context, whether you're selling hamburgers or something else, based on what you learned so far, what kind of KVAs, these are the four key value areas, unrealized value, current value, time to market, ability to innovate. Which KVA do you think you might focus on during backlog refinement? And can you think of any key value metrics that you might focus on in backlog refinement. We'll just monitor the chat for a few seconds, and then I'm going to toss the ball back to Nagesh. So let's see. What KVAs might you focus on in backlog refinement? What KVMs might you focus on? Any ideas? Okay, Jeff is saying time to market and ability to innovate. Tristan, user experience gaps, unrealized value, current value, ability to innovate. Ability to innovate followed by time to market, hmm. depending on context. Yeah, that's interesting. You seem to be a good consultant. Yeah. Depends, it depends. <laughs> that's a good, <laughs> always a good answer for a consultant, yeah. Very good. Yeah, and I feel that, uh, yeah, uh, I, I could see uh, validity in all of those. Um, if I'm seeing that current value is unsatisfactory, then I could focus on that. And I would also encourage people to focus on unrealized value. What is it that is the unmet need that's not addressed? Uh, and think of that. All right, thank you for your answers. and. Nagesh, back to you. Let's take them through sprint planning. Thank you so much, Ravi. Ravi really spoke about something which is very powerful, right? And he, he talked about something which I'm a big fan of. He's, he's talked about something which is like, start with why. He spoke about vision. Scrum or Scrum Guide doesn't recognize that as an artifact. You could consider that as a very complementary artifact because Starting with why gives us the power, which is the vision. And once we have that in place, um, now often that vision needs power. How can you move towards that vision? And Ravi gave examples of product goal, which is our strategic goal. Uh, so in EBM, we have three types of goals. Uh, strategic goal, intermediate goals, and tactical goals. Now the strategic goals are something important that the organization would like to achieve and this goal is big and far away uh, with quite a bit of uncertainties and complexities. Uh, and you need to use empiricism in order to progress towards the strategic goal. An example of that would be that we want to create a self-sustaining colony in Mars by 2026, Elon Musk. Why? Because the vision is make humanity multi-planetary. 
Now, that's a vision, grand, aspirational. Sometimes, is it realistic? That's how vision, vision is supposed to be, right? And, and strategic goal is a step towards the attaining that vision. And we, in Scrum, that could be seen like a product goal. That now, how do we really progress towards the product goal? Um, the way we progress towards that is um, we actually want to run experiments. And we want to run experiments which involve forming hypotheses uh, that are intended to advance towards the current intermediate goal. And that intermediate goal uh, is something which can really help us to take us one more step towards our strategic goal. So we, we, we always want to run those experiments and what could be a good opportunity other than sprint? Every sprint is a hope, says Ken Schwaber. Now, sprint is a great opportunity to run those experiments and validate our hypothesis to know whether we are moving forward uh, to our you know, intermediate goals or not. So which means in sprint, we get focused towards our product goal via our sprint goal, which is more like a tactical goal in EBM. It's a short-term goal. And that really helps us move towards our product goal. And it also is an opportunity for validating all our hypotheses. So I always see that, like, like you said, in backlog refinement, some of the folks said unrealized value. Ravi also talked about what are some of the unmet needs. And the, throughout the sprint, we have opportunities to you know, replan our work and run these multiple hypotheses in a more shorter iterations, which can be stored into a backlog, which is sprint backlog, right? So from a scrum standpoint, our sprint goal, which is more like our tactical goal and our sprint backlog, which is a, which is a plan, which helps us progress towards our sprint goal, which is a hypothesis from an EBM perspective, right? So, Ravi, can you, can you please go to the next slide? So imagine during the sprint planning, the purpose is to inspect the product backlog and adapt the sprint backlog. When we are inspecting the product backlog, we are also inspecting our uh, intermediate goal, which is our product goal. Uh, and we are also looking into uh, adaptation of our sprint backlog, which, we, which means what kind of hypothesis we are going to run in this sprint which will help us move towards that. So which KVAs would you focus on and which KVMs would you focus on uh, during the sprint planning, which can help you um, validate some of your hypothesis? All right. So now you're in sprint planning. You're trying to integrate evidence-based management into Scrum based on what you've heard so far. What KVA do you think you might focus on in sprint planning? What are some illustrative KVMs under those KVAs that will help you sell more hamburgers? All right. Good comment from Jeff, Scrum Guide explicitly talks about including the why with the what into sprint planning. Yes, that's a good point. Very good. Sorry if either one of us misspoke and said that's not the case. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Which key value area KVA might you focus on in sprint planning? And which KVMs might you focus on? Give you a couple of seconds to get your answers and then we will move on. These are good questions to consider. Um, as you digest what we are sharing here. All right, unrealized value. Amrita is saying, consider unrealized value. Mm -hmm. Very good. One thing I wanna share is uh, sprint goals I have often found uh, to be very activity-based. We will, mm -hmm. it's, it's, sometimes it's a compound statement separated by semicolons, commas, and ands which is just a compound aggregate of all the product backlog items that are in your sprint backlog. My advice is 
play with an idea of a human centric sprint backlog. I think Jeff Gothel for Josh, Josh Seiden said something that Nagesh mentioned, which is, I think the intent of anything we deliver is to change human behavior. And what is disappointing is the human being is rarely present in the sprint goal. So my suggestion to you is in sprint planning, maybe the first thing that you could consider is who is the human being, the most important human being that we are trying to serve through this sprint? And what is their biggest unmet need? And how might attainment of the sprint goal address the unmet need of this human being? And what metrics will tell you that we are actually serving this human being, that the human being's behavior has changed? And one technique that you could use is the hypothesis card. We learned about this in the scrum.org PSPO advanced uh, workshop, but consider using a hypothesis statement, a hypothesis card as a stepping stone to framing your sprint goal in terms of human beings and their unmet needs and the desired change in that behavior, all right? All right, so I'm gonna take us through the next step. So we finished refinement. Actually, we started with refinement. Refinement is an ongoing activity, so you never finish it. But we started with refinement. We gave a few days to get feedback from people, synthesize the feedback. We were in sprint planning. Uh, and now we are in Robbie? the sprint. Yes. Martin. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We had one really good question in the chat that I wanted to go ahead before and mention before we move forward. Should a product or sprint goal be tied only to a single KVA? Ah, that's a great question. Yeah, Nagesh, what are your thoughts? And then I could chime in if I have anything valuable yeah. to add. So, so I'm, 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 a, I'm a great fan of a book called Questions Are the Answers, uh, Alan Peace. So is the author. Uh, and so the, I'm going to read the question again, and that will help us get the answer. Should a product or sprint goal be tied to only a single KVA as a best practice? Best practices don't work in complex environments, my dear friend, right? So Arvind, um, we do Scrum, we do Agile because we want to embrace complex environments. And the best fit, actually best is the wrong word, the most optimal fit for complex domains is emergent practices. And which means we are dealing with a domain which is more unknown than known, and we do not know. And that's why we run a hypothesis. So hypothesis could be, like Ravi just said, hypothesis could be that uh, we believe that product or sprint goal uh, can be tied up with only one KVA is the right thing to do. And probably that's a hypothesis we want to run in one sprint planning. And we get to know whether that is right or not uh, at the end of the sprint, right? And, and we will get to know whether that's the right thing to do. If you ask me, I would say, I have seen failures, I have seen success. It depends. You may not like that answer, but I would say that go with what really helps increase value, reduce waste and manage risk. That's what I see. Yeah. Ravi, you want to add something? Yeah, thanks, Nagesh. I, 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 you know, I, that's such a powerful question. I don't have a, a immediate answer. Uh, I would just say my answer is focus on the single most important unmet need of the single most important persona or set of human beings that you want to serve through the sprint. That would, that's my answer. And I know it's not a direct answer because I, I have to think about this, right? But I would, I would agree with what Nagesh is saying uh, in, in the complex environment. Uh, it's so much, there's so much uncertainty that there may not be a best practice. What may work in one day, in one context, may not work in the next day. And the only path is experimentation. Look, I, it looks like this typically works. I don't know if it's gonna work or not, let's try it. And then let's learn, all right? Okay. So uh, I lost track of who's speaking. <laughs> so Nagesh, is it you or I? I think, I think it, the ball goes to you back, Ravi, and all you right. can throw it anytime. <laughs> all right. So now we're in the sprint. Uh, every single uh, daily scrum is an opportunity for micro retrospective, micro review, micro planning uh, in terms of what happened in the last 24 hours, how might we learn, 
and how might we course correct in the next 24 hours so we make progress, incremental progress towards our sprint goal. So now the artifact that is constantly being inspected and updated is the sprint backlog. This is for the developers, by the developers, of the developers. No one tells developers how to do their work. It's right. So we don't have project managers, team leads, uh, directors mucking around, uh, attending the daily scrum, and then telling people how to do their work, right? So developers have context. What is the intermediate goal? Who is the human being we are serving? What is their biggest pain point? And they're making course corrections along the way as new information emerges to try and be as true to the sprint goal as possible, okay? Uh, in the interest of time, I'll probably just leave this as a question for you to ponder on. But along the way for daily scrum, the, the metrics, the, the measures that you are looking at may be more tactical. Uh, in one of my clients where we've used uh, this kind of an approach, we've integrated flow metrics into the daily scrum. And we have a webinar on scrum.org on how to reduce, uh, I think it was how to improve forecasting. So I, in, in a real world client, what we did was we used some of the metrics that are taught in the scrum.org professional scrum with Kanban course and we used Azure DevOps, and we decided that a goal is that every single backlog item should go from active to in production in five days. So what we would do is we would monitor the, the age of the backlog items, and in the daily scrum, if it's three days, three or four days, the card turns yellow, if it's five or more days, the car turns red. So that's an example of creating transparency into what's going on. And it's a leading indicator that if our cycle time targets are not met, it's possible that our sprint goal target will not be met. Therefore, how might we swarm and attack these cards and get them all the way to production so we can reduce the, the cycle time and the time it takes to learn. So that's just an example. Uh, it's very contextual. Think about what kind of metrics you might want to consider when you're in the daily scrum, all right? With that, I wanna pass the ball back to Nagesh. So Nagesh, what do we do in sprint review and retro? How do we integrate EBM? And thanks Ravi, because you you set the right context. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share another book. I'm sorry if it is too many books, but then I'm a big fan of, you know? So this is Actionable Agile Metrics for Predictability by Dan McCanty. So Daniel Vacanti really talks about some, this is one of the best books I've read so far in my agile career. I would highly recommend that. Uh, this is more like stories. And uh, so the, Ravi spoke about some great flow measures and they are in this book. Uh, so do read them. So yeah, Carlos, Mr. Khanban. So review, sprint review and sprint retrospective. Sprint review is an opportunity to inspect the increment and adapt the product back product backlog. And sprint, so one of the big failures in sprint reviews is when uh, we do not know how do we measure the success of the sprint. And this is what I have seen. I have seen products, projects going dark green to dark red, watermelonic, right? You think everything is gonna be fine and suddenly you see everything breaks. Um, the, I, I will never forget the sprint review in which my team was like, I was coaching, it was being my failure than my team, by the way. So my, they were like, hey, we finished all the work. Now it's gonna be fantastic. And stakeholders are frustrated and see that none of the objectives are met. But a team is like, hey, we thought it's going to be a super awesome sprint. CSAT is going to be high. All the work is completed. But the, the stakeholders are like, yeah, none of my objectives are met. So I want to ask you, have you been in situation like this where, you know, you are in a sprint review where all the work is complete, but the stakeholders are unhappy because they say none of my objectives are met. So you can put it in the chat, yes, no, and it is okay to say no, right? So, <laughs> Ravi, you know, you wanna... yeah, while we're waiting for uh, answers, I'll tell you a real world story. Nagesh and I were working for this client and uh, we, we got the C-suite to attend the sprint review. So we were using Nexus, Nexus. And actually we were using Nexus Plus. 
So we had a sprint review and the team finishes the review and then we pause and we solicit feedback from stakeholders because that's the intent of a sprint review. It's, it's not a demo. It's really an opportunity to crowdsource the wisdom of stakeholders and team members and collaborate, get the best ideas and figure out based on the increment and based on inspecting the market changes, what might we learn and what might be the next set of experiments that we try in the upcoming sprint and perhaps the next few sprints. That's really the intent of a sprint review. And you could hear pin drop silence. You could hear crickets. So we are like, what the heck just happened? Because there's no, we are soliciting feedback. Nobody's saying anything. So we exit the sprint review and the Nexus is like spiking the football. It's like, man, we nailed it, man. We killed it, this sprint. But what's happening behind the scenes is the stakeholders were furious. And so they started blowing up the phones of the CTO, the uh, VP of product management and saying, that was the worst thing. What the heck are you guys doing? So two sets of people leave the sprint review with completely different interpretations of what the heck just happened. The Nexus leaves the review thinking, man, that was the best sprint ever. And the stakeholders leave the room thinking, man, that was the worst sprint ever. So anyway, uh, real world stories. And again, as Nagesh said, uh, as servant leaders, it's our failure. That performance of the company is a, is a mirror for Nagesh and I. So we are trying, we, we take it on the chin and that's why we try to keep getting better. And, and this presentation is another step in our attempt to become better coaches. All right, so uh, we've got some answers. Uh, it's normal stakeholders are not happy based on a great sprint backlog. It may be due to lack of communication. Yes, uh, John Long, thank you for sharing that. All right, Nagesh, back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, keep interacting like this, guys. We are loving it. So one of the things which we found very helpful uh, is when we complement evidence-based management and look into some of the key value areas and key value measures, which can really help us inspect the increment. And um, one of the ways is by complementing it with product scoreboard. Ravi showed you some examples of scoreboards where you can really start looking into, hey, how is our cost going on? How is our revenue going on? How is our customer satisfaction? How is our employee satisfaction? Here is a tip from me. For every measure we have, we need to balance it with a countermeasure. I'll give you an example. Imagine that you have higher, highest customer satisfaction. Imagine a scale of one to five, one being least, five being highest. You had a great sprint review, five out of five CSAT score. It might be possible that in that sprint, there was too much pressure um, in order to trade off quality, uh, we have traded off quality for speed. Maybe that employees were too much pressurized. So we might want to balance it out with measuring also employee satisfaction. Sometimes uh, we have pressure from business and our focus is, hey, we want to be fast. We want to be quick. So focus is on time to market. So a, a recommendation is to balance it out with also measuring some things on quality, like, hey, it is good that we are, we are becoming twice faster, but does that increase our defect density? Does that also increase our technical debt? So having that kind of measures and countermeasures is very helpful, and that can create that alignment which is missing with the stakeholders um, during the sprint reviews. Very cool. Thank you, Nagesh. Uh, real world story, we had a client where we introduced evidence-based management. And when we plotted the trends in defect fixes, uh, we saw that there was almost like a sine curve. So defects would go down. And then after maybe a few sprints, defects start going up. Then we try to get them un under control. It goes down, then it goes up, right? So I was facilitating a conversation. Again, this was, uh, we had introduced Nexus Plus. So I was facilitating a conversation uh, to inspect this and to learn what can be learned. Why is defects going up like this? And I asked the question, what can be learned? And the wisdom of the attendees was, it's interesting. The defects seem to go up about one or two months after each batch of layoffs. So this company was owned by a private equity fund. 
and whenever they had a bad quarter they would let go a bunch of people because they are focusing on the metric which is budget or the burn rate but the countermeasure that nagesh was saying is look if you focus on the burn rate you can optimize the burn rate you can actually fire everybody and the burn rate will go down but guess what you may sub optimize for quality you may sub optimize for employee delight you may sub optimize for employee churn rate so it's such a complex adaptive system with interconnected cause, causes and effects and if you laser focus on one and you exclude the others it's possible that you will get blindsided what we are inviting you to do is to create a holistic view of your system all models are wrong some are useful right it's going to be flawed because it's so hard to model the behavior of a human of a complex system but what you can do is you can go in intentionally to say yes you know what guys we don't have money to pay the bills we are going to cut cut budget and we recognize that a domino effect of cutting the budget is that we are going to have some unintended consequences later on okay let me do a quick time check here for mark and katrin are we here for 90 minutes or 60 minutes 90 90 all right okay so we still got some time all right so when you are in sprint review sprint retro any closing thoughts nagesh uh, on this slide before we move on i think uh, just what i want to say is uh, one of the one of the ways in which uh, we can improve sprint retrospectives because often sprint retrospectives are a lot qualitative uh, how are we feeling how was the sprint how have you been feeling mad sad glad all those things different complementary practices uh, we can complement it with ebm and make it more quantitative again balance out qualitative with quantitative and focus on some of the organization's capability like looking into some of the aspects kvms from our uh, ability to innovate uh, how was our technical day paying some attention to quality technical quality and looking into some of the things like our cycle time um how many bills did we had in this previous sprint uh, we had three bills versus two bills versus we had only one bill uh, what is our integration frequency these will really help us to make the next sprint more valuable that's what i would like to add ravi very Let's good go to the next all right So again maybe we will leave this as a food for thought in the interest of moving on um what might you focus on in sprint review and retro right what kind of uh kvas and kvms and now we are approaching the end of the presentation part and hopefully entering into the best part which is interaction but as we start summing up the conversation these are the 10 steps target value visualize value engage the community cr uh, crowdsource the wisdom right then focus if everything is important nothing is important focus what is most important and quantify quantifying is what scares the crap out of most people because they say ravi i don't know nagesh i don't know what's going to be the impact how can i quantify human the change in human behavior and our answer is fantastic because that is the beginning of humility and curiosity we are in a complex adaptive system we are using scrum precisely because we don't know not knowing is not an admission of failure not knowing is the beginning of success because you are acknowledging i don't know and precisely because i don't know i want to put the least amount of company time money and reputation at risk by trying out small controlled experiments and listening to the market and course correcting so it's possible that when you challenge your teams to quantify the targets you may encounter resistance because in an in a world which rewards guarantees and bravado and even pseudo guarantees right false guarantees there might be a glass ceiling which prevents us from acknowledging humility and vulnerability being vulnerable right so be prepared for resistance fear when you invite your stakeholders to quantify the targets and reframe it by saying them saying to them we are guaranteed to fail that's why we are in a complex adaptive system so don't be scared when you quantify a target 
it's not going to be weaponized to beat you up. It's just supposed to create a target because if you don't have a target, you cannot inspect. Inspection, Ken Schreiber taught me, is comparing and contrasting the gap between target reality and current reality. But if you don't quantify the target, how the heck are you going to inspect? And if you don't inspect, how the heck are you going to learn? And if you don't learn, how the heck are you going to adapt? So it's oxymoronic to say we are going to use scrum and empiricism and then not quantify targets. All right, so quantification is important. And then frame a hypothesis. Every PBI is a hypothesis. Frame it as a hypothesis, use a hypothesis card and say, we believe that by delivering this PBI in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, we will observe this change in this human behavior. And this is how we will measure the change in the human behavior. And maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't happen. Who, the, who knows? But we will be humble, we will be curious, we will learn. Now you deploy your experiment into production. That's your PBI. You look at your scoreboard, see how people are reacting, you inspect, you learn, and then rinse and repeat. You go to the next set of experiments, the next set of hypotheses, all right? So this is how you integrate Scrum and EBM. We have overlaid the 10 steps over the Scrum framework. Just something to get started. Take what resonates, dump what doesn't. One of my coaches told me feedback and ideas are like a Christmas sweater. We are giving you a Christmas sweater, Nagesh and I. Try it on. If you like it, keep it on. If you don't like it, put it in the closet. Try something else. But if you always do what you always got, you're going to always get what, you're all, what you've always got. And if you don't like what you're getting, try, time to try something different, all right? So we are offering these ideas not as the only way to do things, not as the best way, but a possible way. And what resonates, take it. What doesn't, don't take it, all right? Just let it go. All right, I want to share feedback is the breakfast of champions. I like it. All right, uh, closing thoughts, closing thoughts. Except that failure is guaranteed. Uh, we have lots of companies where they value guarantees and certainty and they bring agile and scrum. That is so oxymoronic on time, on scope, on budget. If you want guarantees, if failure is not an option, don't waste time with agile and scrum. Failure is not an option. Maybe you're not in the complex domain. Don't, don't use scrum. Failure is guaranteed in scrum. The biggest failure is failing to learn. All right. The biggest failure is continuing to invest precious company time, money, reputation uh, on some kind of a feature or a roadmap without pausing to see is it working or not, right? The biggest failure is the failure to learn and course correct. Your best friend for learning is market reaction. The only source of truth is the market. Gunther Verheyen said that. Only source of truth is the market. And the market will speak to you through evidence. Befriend evidence. Evidence is not the enemy. Don't try to figure it out by yourself. None of us is smarter than all of us. Engage your community. Your biggest enemy in engagement is apathy. People are apathetic. If what you're talking about doesn't resonate with what they are talking about, please translate Scrum Agile into selling more hamburgers. Find out what is it that people will want to sell? What lights up their eyes? Translate your language, your jargon to the language and jargon of the human being you are trying to influence and engage. And then finally, take EBM, operationalize it with the framework of Scrum. One of my clients told me, he read a book called Mike about micro habits. And he gave me an example. He said, Ravi, I've been wanting to be a more fit person. And I thought every New Year's, I make a resolution, I'm going to exercise. I never exercise. And he read the book. And he said, you know what, Ravi, I brush my teeth every morning. I said, let me do 10 sit-ups every morning after I brush my teeth. So he had an existing habit and he attached a new habit to an existing habit. So he doesn't have to think. I brush my teeth, I do 10 sit-ups. Maybe not as good as doing 30 minutes every, every day or 60 minutes every day, but probably a little bit better than not doing anything. So if you have an established habit of Scrum, you can attach a micro habit of evidence-based management into the pre-existing habit. All right. Uh, some resources uh, that might help you. This is the blog. If you read just one blog, 
five minutes, read this blog, We've got a whole bunch of resources. Uh, I would strongly recommend consider the scrum.org classes. Um, the, those that are relevant to this webinar are PSPO, PS, where we talk about the vision, PSPO advanced, a lot about hypothesis driven delivery, more entrepreneurial product ownership, PSU, how do you understand unmet needs and change human behavior? Pally, this is about leadership, and EBM is about evidence-based management. All right, so some suggestions. Ask us for help. Uh, if you can figure this out by yourself, more power to you. If you need some help, Nagesh and I are here to support you. Now let's uh, pause for Q&A. What questions do you have? One question, Ravi, somebody asked is, will this presentation with the links be shared? And I would wanted yes. to say yes for the yes. low, low price of? No price, uh, no price. Our only price is uh, commit to reducing and disrupting the needless waste of human potential in the name of Agile and Scrum. That's the only price, all right? Very good, uh, other questions? While we're waiting for questions, uh, I'm gonna share something about the why, right? Nagesh was talking about why. And I'm an entrepreneur and I, I've, over the last two years, I've been building my own product, uh, Al Dente, which is related to EBM. But it has been such a humbling experience because there are things that I, I found it so easy to teach people. But when it comes to myself, it is very hard to practice what I preach. So I have a newfound respect for all of you practitioners out there. But I wanna tell you one of my biggest takeaways from building a product with a geographically dis distributed Scrum team over the last two years. And the lesson is from Michelangelo. So I think Michelangelo got a compliment about one of his statues. I don't know if it's David or whatever, right? And he says, I just liberated the angel. I saw the angel in the marble and I chipped until I saw it free, right? He liberated the angel. And in my mind, when I look at passionate and successful teams, everybody comes to work to liberate the angel they see in the marble. The product owner wants to build the best solution, liberate the best solution from the marble. Developers want to liberate the most high quality, brilliantly built architecture design code, right? Scrum Master wants to unleash the most amazing angel of culture. So product owner is trying to liberate the angel of value. Developers are liberating the angel of excellence, software craftsmanship. Scrum Master is liberating the angel of culture. We are all going to work to set the angel free. Be clear about what are the angels that you are setting free. And then use Scrum and evidence-based management to align and keep chipping away until you set that angel free. So those are my, my closing thoughts as we are waiting for questions. Nagesh, what is the closing thought you want to leave our audience with? My only closing thought would be um, run a, have a hypothesis, right? A hypothesis could be that maybe I want to try EBM, maybe try one key value area, maybe try with one key value measure. Maybe I want to try with one event in Scrum and uh, the only way to validate that hypothesis is by running a small experiment and then proving it to yourself whether this works or not. Um, and I would say that the, don't do it alone. Always have a community. Always find someone uh, very passionate just like you because together uh, we can achieve more. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then I'm looking at the questions that were uh, asked in the beginning. Mark said, how to sell EBM without speaking EBM lingo? I would say be curious, give up your agenda. It's not about Scrum, it's not about EBM. Ask people, be curious. What matters to you? What's the angel you see in the marble? What makes you happy? What makes you go home with a smile on your face? What makes you go home feeling defeated? And see if there is alignment between that human being's goals and whether an, an EBM's goals, and if EBM might be a way to help that human being liberate the angel that they care about. Uh, Mark, any follow-up about how to sell EBM without speaking EBM lingo? 
It was one of your questions, I think. Yeah, no, that was great, Ravi. Thank you. All right, very good. The next question was, can EBM be integrated with other agile framework strategies that is Kanban? Nagesh, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, EBM is very complimentary because um, always remember what I, when I started, I started with saying that yeah, consider EBM like more like a uh, camera sitting on three legs, which is your tripod. And your three tripod legs are empiricism, goals, and measures, um, right? So think about now any framework. Um, Kanban is strategy for uh, improving your flow through some practices like visualizing your workflow, uh, limiting your work in progress, maybe improving your uh, throughput, creating a balance between efficiency, effectiveness, and predictability. Can we learn through our previous uh, experience? Okay. If that's the case, can we really have goals and start achieving them? Can we really measure? I think if the answers are like, yes, then probably you can apply EBM, right? And this could be a hypothesis, I always say, right? Uh, this is what we have explored that can we use EBM as a complementary practice to Kanban or extreme programming or maybe any other framework? And that's a hypothesis. I would, I would, that could be a call of action. Yeah. Rock hypothesis and let us know. We will learn from you. Yeah, I want to add to what Nagesh was saying. So when I attended that EBM workshop with Ken, what Ken told me is, Ravi, we can implement, this is framework agnostic. You want, you implement EBM with Waterfall, implement it with SAFE, with Agile, Scrum, Kanban. Uh, I have found that in companies where they have had a bad experience with Agile and Scrum, we don't even use those words. Don't use the A word, don't use the S word. Just use the value word. Usually most companies are curious and interested about creating more value. So don't use the A word or S word, just start with the B word or use whatever word will resonate in terms of value. And I feel that EBM is uh, framework agnostic. And that's what Ken told me. And he's the guy who created EBM. All right. Uh, the next question. So thank you so much, Amani, for your question. Um, let's see. I'm doing a time check. Uh, Amani, did we answer your question? Let's see if she's here. Or do you have a follow-up? She may have dropped. All right. Uh, let me move on. Um, Frederick, how to get teams, businesses excited to do this? Um, I would say find what teams and businesses are pre-excited to do. Find out what are they passionate about right now and ask yourself the question, could this help them get more of what they want? So in my mind, if we can get them excited and, and reframe this not as a headache, that some agile coach like Nagesh and I are pushing rather as an accelerant, as an enabler to get where they've been wanting to go anyway. I have a feeling that might get them excited. Uh, always ask, be curious about the other human beings agenda. Let go of your agenda, right? One thing I would recommend is uh, I'm undergoing a 25 week certification to be a better coach from Coactive, uh, the Coactive Training Institute. And one of the first things that we learn is you've got to get to know the client's agenda. Hold the client's agenda, not your agenda. So, and the way you find out the client's agenda is by asking the question, what is your agenda? What do you want in life? What makes you happy, right? So find the client's agenda. And you may offer this as a possible way for the client to meet their agenda. Uh, Nagesh, stop me at any time uh, if, if you have questions and there are, if you have things to add. Now, the next question, Nagesh, uh, what metrics can I put in place from Tony? What would you say, Nagesh? Um, I'm going to give a consultant answer. It depends on what problem you're trying to solve. If you have a problem of your customer complaining about, I'm not getting releases quickly, I would say, focus on time to market and balance it out with ability to innovate. But if your customers are having low customer satisfaction, you then probably uh, start focusing on unrealized value. And again, look into that. How can you really uh, bridge that satisfaction gap? So 
the answer would be what problem you're trying to solve. Yes, and the evidence-based management guide is a PDF document available for free download. It has some suggested metrics or illustrative metrics that you may consider if you're drawing a complete blank. So that could be one place where you, uh, where you start. All right, okay, I'm going through the questions. Uh, the next one was, let's see, scrolling up. How to get started? What metrics can I, how to get started with EBM? Uh, Mark, uh, we get some suggestions in this webinar, how to get started, start with the vision and so on, product goal, any follow-ups? Covered it. All right. All right. Uh, how to define KPO, key performance outcomes. I would say this is from Milo, I think. Sorry if I butchered your name. I would say use the evidence-based management guide uh, for KVAs and K KVMs as a starter. If it doesn't resonate, make it better. But if you're drawing a blank, start there. Organizations, uh, this is from Amrita. Organizations still focus on on time on budget, on scope, or let's say our best quality, how to use EBM to address this, Nagesh? Uh, I, would, I, I would say that probably help organizations uh, to really understand wh whether focusing on the iron triangle is helping solve the business problem. If the answer is yes, then why do you have to focus on EBM? See, I always say, Ravi would also say the same thing. If you already have happy employees, happy customers, you are delivering value early and often uh, with customer delight, quality and employee morale, you don't need a framework or you don't have to do something. But if any of these things are missing, um, because I have seen, can you really deliver on time within budget and within scope and still customers are unhappy? Yeah, this is like operation successful, patient is in coma, right? So if that's the case, then probably shifting more from a uh, output driven to outcome is going to be helpful, right? I would say again, running small hypothesis could be helpful, small experiments uh, and not make it sound like a radical change, uh, but run more like an experiment. I learned this from Jurgen Apello from Management 3.0 that introduce change, not sounding like change, but like an experiment because when you say I'm running a small experiment, you're also setting an expectation that experiments do fail and we are going to learn from them. Right? So yeah. I would say just small experiment. Yeah, and you know, yeah. I would ask the question, very powerful question that Nagesh said, how is it working out for you? How is it working out for you to frame success in terms of on time, on scope, uh, on, uh, on schedule? On time, on scope, what am I missing? Um, the, the three triangles, right? I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, but the first question is ask them, how is it working out for you? What's working really well? Where are you disappointed? And then ask the question, what would you like to try next? Here are what, and here are some principles and values and practices that I have to offer, but tell me, what do you wanna try next? And this question is very important from a psychology perspective. The psychology is the mistake that I have made when I was a naive, more naive agile coach. I was so excited about all my agile principles and values and tools. I would go into the conversation and say, let's try this. Let's try daily scrum. Let's, let's try EBM. Let's try sprint review. And they immediately recoil because my energy is like overwhelming. And so I learned to lean back a little bit and to ask, more powerful questions. How is this working out? What would you like to try? One of, my, one of my customers, a CIO said, his dream agile enablement would be for an agile coach to lay out agile principles, values, and practices on the table, maybe in a cafeteria. And as people come to get coffee or lunch, or they're getting a snack from the fridge, they naturally gravitate or they put something in the microwave, waiting for a few seconds, they naturally gravitate towards this table and maybe the agile coach is sitting there and they say, this is interesting. Hypothesis driven delivery. What is this? What is this? This is a scrum. Interesting. What is this? And maybe some of them will say, 
yeah, no, thank you. And some of them will say, hey, Nagesh, hey, this hypothesis-driven delivery resonates with, with me. Can you help me out? That's a pull mechanism. But the first thing is to ask, how is it working out for you? And give the choice back to the human being. What would you like to try next? How may I serve you? So in my mind, if you're an on-time, on-scope, on-budget kind of a, a, an organization, ask them, how's it working out for you? What would you like to try next? How may I serve you? All right. Uh, I don't know if Amrita is still on the call or not. I, maybe she's not here. Amrita, if you are, please speak up if you have follow-ups. We've got nine minutes uh, left. Sorry, Mark. Hey, hey, Ravi. Oh. hey, Ravi and Nagesh. Hi, this is not Amrita, but her husband, Sandeep. Sorry, I logged on from my wife's laptop and uh, automatically Zoom took uh, that login. Uh, okay. But it's Sandeep, and thanks for the answer, Ravi and Nagesh. Uh, it really helped. So uh, I would uh, I would rather give uh, opportunity to uh, our other colleagues to ask their questions. But thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Sandeep. And we got eight minutes left. Amani is not here. She said, what's the mindset related to lashing out EBM? I don't know what she meant, but I'm going to skip her question. Arvind, distinction between delivery metrics versus value metrics from Arvind Nagesh. What would you say to Arvind? I would say... Uh... Delivery metrics are more related to, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm making an assumption that it's more, you're talking about um, the organization's capability to deliver value. That's more internal to the organization, which is ability to innovate and our time to market measures. But um, then market value is more about outcomes and impact, which is our current value and uh, unrealized value. Yeah, and the, the example that Nagesh gave uh, of the pizza shop, or a Domino's or Pizza Hut. By the way, Don McGrill has got an amazing webinar on scrum.org, a 60 minute webinar on agile metrics. So if watching that webinar may give you some clarity. So if you're a, if you're Domino's or Pizza Hut, a delivery metric might be how many pizzas can I make, right? How many pepperonis, how many cheese pizzas? How much time did it take from the time that, you know, you start putting the dough on that pan or whatever, and then the pizza is ready. How many minutes did it take to go from your, your shop to the customer? But value is, are people eating your pizzas? Are they throwing it? What kind of ratings are they giving for, for Pizza Hut? Are they happy? Are they coming back? Uh, reordering? I would say that's the distinction between delivery and value because a company is not in the business to deliver pizzas, right? The company is in the business for happy customers. Uh, who keep coming back. All right, Arvind, thank you for the question. Uh, if you are still on the call, Arvind, if you have a follow-up, please stop us. Uh, otherwise, I will keep going. Uh, Tristan. Hey, Robbie. Yes, Mark. Arvind actually did in the chat, he put another, this might be a good one to introduce based on your last comment. He said, is continuous delivery reduce time to market almost a prerequisite to maximize the value of EBM and Scrum for timely feedback for real customers? I, I uh, as I'm growing older, I'm trying to move away from absolute statements. So I wouldn't say continuous delivery is essential. I, I would say there might be many practices which shorten the feedback loop so maybe what I would say is shortening the learning loop, shortening the course correction loop is helpful, but I wouldn't make a sweeping statement that if you don't have continuous delivery, you cannot have EBM, you cannot have Scrum, you cannot have continuous learning and course correction. And I will uh, defer to Nagesh. Nagesh, what do you think? That's interesting, right, Ravi? Because this comes with a notion when we consider continuous delivery more attached with tooling and infrastructure. But when we, when we treat that more like a mindset portion, um, uh, and then, then, then it is, I, I would say, what is the purpose of having that in first place? Uh, shortening the feedback cycles. Um, and if that is happening without calling it as continuous delivery pipeline, um, then that serves the purpose. And I would, I would just compliment what you said. Uh, I don't think there is one side which fits all, right? Yeah. I would say last comment, and then I'm gonna hand it back to Mark and to Katrin and to Jamie. I would say continuous curiosity, continuous humility, 
continuous learning and continuous course correction, and most importantly, continuous service. Most of us exist to serve human beings. I feel that if continuous service is there, your desire to help another human being live a better life, a more fulfilling life, you're going to figure the rest out. Love it. I, yeah. So I would say don't start chasing DevOps and BizOps and all these bloody buzzwords and you know Bitcoin and blockchain. Stay with continuous service. Just be in service to the human beings you exist to serve. And then the universe will show you the way. All right. With that, I want to pass the baton back over to Mark, to Katrin, to Jamie. It's been an honor and privilege to hang out with you guys. Uh, and uh, let us know how you want to start wrapping up. What a treat, Robbie and Nagesh. Thank you so much for putting this presentation together, for entertaining our questions, for being so prepared, having such a nice polished presentation. I personally found this extremely useful and I can't wait to get the recording and listen to it a second time myself. So we'll be publishing the recording probably later today. If not later today, we'll do it first thing tomorrow. And Ravi, you gave the nod to share the presentation slides as well. Yep. So yes, we'll... yes, I will. I will email. Uh, I will email the slides to you, Mark. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Very much. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time. So I think that's going to bring things to a close for this edition of Scrum Masters of the Universe. Again, Nagesh and Ravi, thank you so much. Um, I will also include ways to get in touch with Ravi and Nagesh. I'll put some links in the chat as we went along. If you're interested in either of their services, they're definitely available and ready to serve you uh, if, you're, if you need to be served. So thank you again. Appreciate the great engagement and we'll see you next time, okay? All right, All right thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.